Hey, hey, we are recording. All right. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. All right, people are joining, people are hopping on, taking time out of their beautiful July afternoon to join us here at the Barton webinar. Welcome, everybody. Good to be back. I was gone last week. Got to take a little family vacation up in Minnesota on a lake. Had a great time. Turned a year older. Mary Jo, nice to see you. Raising her hand. She's excited. <laughs> All right, who else we got here? Uh, Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie. Good to see you again. Uh, Gary is back. Grace. Lots of familiar faces. Good to see you guys. Krish. Looking forward to your questions, Chris. I always have some good ones. Patrick, good to see you. And Tina, hello from across the uh, street. Well, not uh, across the city. <laughs> All right, good to have everybody. Well, hey, looks like, uh, are we on Facebook yet, Leslie? Not quite? Nope. All right, we'll give it a little bit more time. Hey, just uh, hop in the chat, say hello. Tell us where you're calling in from. And hey, even Terry, good to see you. Tell us uh, what you guys did for the fourth and uh, how you celebrated. Did you see that video from Los Angeles? The, uh, so the governor said, no fireworks, uh, no display, stay home. And, uh, and so the, these people were, were scanning over Los Angeles. There were fireworks everywhere going off, like from every neighborhood, practically every house in, in Los Angeles had illegal fireworks going up uh, the whole time. Um, even our governor Newsom can't suppress us. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Yeah, we're in South Dakota and our governor, I think she should be voted number one governor in, in the world. Honestly, I think she's pretty awesome. Christy Noem. So kudos to her. Where, where was it? The governor, the governor of, uh, oh no, no, no. It was the mayor of, of, um, Lancaster, California. Um, the, uh, the, uh, they passed a law that the, the people couldn't shoot off fireworks. Uh, so the mayor says, I'll do it. And so the mayor stood and pushed all the buttons and, uh, and shot off all the fireworks for the city. Uh, <laughs> the only fireworks. firework display in California on the 4th of July. Wow. That's, that's crazy. That's too bad. I think uh, th there's a meme out there that says, I can't wait till the 4th of July so we can celebrate our freedom. Uh, you know, get get out of our houses, <laughs> off of quarantine to celebrate our freedom. Like, yep, uh, liberty is a beautiful thing. So, all right. Well, hey, we are going to get into things today. We're going to talk about the thyroid. And uh, let me just do a little quick housekeeping. So welcome, everybody. This is our weekly webinar where we talk about type 2 and diabetes, blood sugar, and issues related to that. Um, the main website that you want to go to right now is bartonwebinar.com. That will reference um, our different things we talk about, including our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, and our products, and including the Diabetes Solution Kit and our supplements. And so we do this webinar every week with Dr. Scott Saunders as a service to our customers and viewers. We um, have sold over a million copies of this kit right here and you can get the printed copy if you don't have the printed copy you can pick that up on bartonwebinar.com as well so we've been helping people uh, reverse type 2 for many many years and um, it's just something with this webinar we've been doing for a, almost a year now and we have been just really enjoying getting to know our customers more, answering questions. And so that's what this time is all about. And this week we're going to be talking about thyroid. But if you have any questions related to type two or anything like that, feel free to enter them into the chat or the Q&A section in Zoom uh, or comment on Facebook. And Leslie will relay, relay those to us as we are live here. So um, a quick disclaimer that this webinar is for informational purposes only and uh, anything we say or talk about is not to be taken as personal medical advice because everybody is different and you don't want to do anything without your own health practitioner's um, guidance if you have any questions or issues or you know things like that so without further ado 
Dr. Scott Saunders, take it away and let's talk about that thyroid. Okay, so one of the things that came up was a recent uh, study um, done in the Netherlands about uh, diabetes and thyroid. And so since we're discussing diabetes, uh, it was very interesting to note that people who had low thyroid uh, had a, a significantly increased risk of developing diabetes. So they, they studied 8,000 people and none of them have diabetes at the beginning. Uh, but, um, and they tested their thyroid level, they tested their blood sugar levels and their hemoglobin A1C, and they followed them over time. And the ones that had the um, lower thyroid function uh, had a significantly increased, about 40% increased risk of developing diabetes uh, over the period of time. So um, one of the questions that we want to answer today is, um, why is this? Why is there this connection between low thyroid and diabetes? Um, and part of it is metabolism. Remember that type 2 is a problem of metabolism. It's a problem of too much. It's a problem of slow metabolism. Uh, it's a problem of, of a lack of exercise and a lot of energy being, being put in. So a lot of gas in the gas tank without the car going anywhere. So the gas is spilling out all over the place and that's what sugar is, the gas. Um, so uh, if you think about that and connect that with thyroid, what does thyroid do? Well, um, thyroid makes your metabolism run a little faster and run a little slower. So it's the general overall control of metabolism. And it's not a big control. It's not something like uh, where it shouldn't be uh, unless you have some kind of disease. So if you have, uh, uh, like during the winter, for example, uh, there's less uh, heat coming in from the outside so your thyroid level goes up and it increases the metabolism. So you burn more, so you make more heat uh, internally. And then in the summer, when it's really hot, your thyroid goes down a little bit. Uh, and that, uh, so you don't make as much heat uh, and you don't uh, burn as many calories either. So if you think about that, if someone is eating too many calories and their thyroid level is low, what's going to happen? Well, it's kind of obvious they're going to start, they're going to burn less calories and they're taking in more. So of course they're going to have a higher risk for developing diabetes because it's a, a disease or condition of too much. And if you have a low thyroid, then if you have too much, even more because you're using up less gas and still putting as much gas in. So it's going to spill out. That's what's happening. Does that make sense? Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Hmm. So thyroid is, is it an organ or is it a gland or is it? Oh, excellent question. Okay, let's start with what the thyroid is. Um, there's a gland right here in your neck. Um, if you, I can't see mine because I got my tie on. But if you swallow, if you look up and swallow, um, you'll see it move up and down. Uh, and you should just barely see it move up and down. It shouldn't be obvious. If it's obvious, then you have a large thyroid. Um, but if, if you just see this, this uh, and it's real soft, it's not hard, you can't feel it, but it's a gland. And it, uh, and it runs right along the base, uh, like over the top of your clavicles and underneath your Adam's apple. So the Adam's apple goes up and down and the thyroid moves with it. And uh, it, is, um, it produces a hormone called thyroxin. It's a, the thyroid hormone. And what that does is regulates in a general overall way the metabolism. Um, what's really interesting about this is um, the, the thyroid gets its orders primarily from the adrenal glands. Remember, the adrenal glands are the, your, your circadian rhythm. So in the morning, you release adrenaline and uh, cortisol, and you get your metabolism going, and then at night, it goes down to zero. So you have this circadian rhythm. Um, and that de is dependent on light hitting the eyeballs. So in days when the days are longer, then you have a slightly different uh, circadian rhythm, which changes the thyroid. Now, why is that important? Because there are so many people out there that say, oh, I have a bad thyroid, I'm taking thyroid hormone. Um, but it's not the thyroid at all. It's really the adrenal glands. If your adrenal glands aren't functioning very well, 
then your thyroid won't function well. But the primary problem is often, most often, the adrenal glands and not the thyroid. Interesting. Now, what what other options are there? Well, there's um, there's one called um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And uh, that is one of the autoimmune thyroid dysfunctions. And autoimmune means that your own immune cells, your own immune um, proteins, the, they're called uh, globulin proteins, are, uh, are active mm -hmm. against your own thyroid, your own thyroid gland, like an enzyme. In this case, it's PPO, thyroid peroxidase enzyme. That's what your doctor will measure if they're looking for Hashimoto's thyroiditis, is they'll measure this uh, TPO. Uh-oh. Dr. Scott is frozen. We need someone to thaw him out a little bit. <laughs> Dr. Scott, come back. Come back to us. Hello. It was getting so good. Ah, <laughs> um, hopefully it'll click back on here. Uh, let's see. Got a different conversation I'm going on here. So, uh, well, while we're waiting for him, um, what can we, <laughs> what can we talk about here? Um, let's see. Looks like he dropped off. He'll be back. So, all right, well, I'll do another little intro here. So the Diabetes Solution Kit is uh, really what we base our program in. This is a, a three-phase program that talks about really how to reverse the effects of type 2 diabetes. And in this program, we talk about eating low carb. And it's 20 grams of carbs or less that you really want to start doing to kick off, uh, to really turn things around. And... After a while, depending on how much, how long you've had it, hey, there he is. Uh, after a while, you can go to a more of a maintenance program. So, um, okay, looks like Dr. Saunders is back. So let's get back to the thyroid. Okay, so we were talking about Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Yes. So antibodies uh, are, are built up against enzymes in the, in the thyroid gland and in the body where this thyroid, this TPO enzyme is used. <clears throat> Think of antibodies not so much as the immune system that, uh, that uh, kills things, but rather as the cleanup crew. So the janitors of your body is the immune system. And what, that, what they do is they clean up everything. If you get uh, bacteria in your blood, they clean that up. If you get uh, proteins in your blood that aren't supposed to be there, they clean that up. And so when you're getting autoimmune kinds of problems, it's because there are um, proteins that shouldn't be there. So the janitors come in and they clean it up. That's not supposed to be there. You know, that's, that's not where it's supposed to be. So if you're making too much of this TPO enzyme. Now, here's the, here's the cool thing about it. Um, for people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, one of the things that's been found is iodine doesn't work. In fact, iodine might make it worse. Because uh, when, you, when you, you're deficient in iodine, you add iodine and you can make more of the, the th thyroxin, the, the hormone, the thyroid hormone. Um, but uh, that causes you to make more antibodies too. So the reason or one of the reasons why people get this autoimmune thyroid problem is because they don't have enough selenium. Selenium is a very common deficiency, especially in the United States, but other places like Japan, where this was first characterized. And if you don't have selenium, then the TPO enzyme doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, you just make more and make more and make more, but it's not working because the cells are going, we need more of that enzyme, but it's not working. So they just make another one. No, that's not working. They throw it out. And then the immune system comes in and starts cleaning it up. And they're cleaning up all this, uh, this extra enzyme. Uh, and, and it's not because you have the, the antibodies that you have the problem. The problem stems from something more, and that is to make the enzyme work. So you need selenium. Uh, so there was a study done in Japan that showed that adding selenium supplements um, decreased the, the production of, of 
uh, uh, antibodies against the TPO enzyme. So the antibody levels dropped down as people were given selenium. Um, and, and, and this has been repeated. So uh, it's actually very good uh, that, uh, that you have antibodies to clean it up. It's not a bad thing, but what you need to do is fix the problem. And so very often selenium is a problem. And since it's so common in the United States, we often see the same kinds of issues in the United States. The United States is interesting. So where you are, South Dakota, Minnesota, the, the Midwest area um, has been classically very low in iodine. There's yeah. no iodine in the soil. Um, if you go fishing, you don't get any iodine from fish. You don't get, there's no way to get iodine. In fact, um, about uh, 15 years ago, they did a study on high school girls and found that 12% of them have goiter, which is an enlarged thyroid gland. Uh, mm -hmm. because they don't have enough iodine. Uh, so that's the other issue with thyroid. So someone had the bright idea, hey, you know what? The, the, the soils in the United States are all deficient in iodine. There's no really uh, problem with adding iodine, so let's put it in the salt. Since everybody's using salt, let's mm -hmm. just uh, put iodine in the salt. And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. So they did. They made iodized salt. And you know what? That worked. And then in the 1970s, they started saying, well, don't eat salt, it's bad for you. Your <laughs> blood pressure will go up. Okay, it's not true, by the way, but that's a sidelight. Um, the uh, uh, don't use salt. And then in the 1990s, everybody started going, ooh, I'm gonna use Himalayan salt. I'm gonna use sea salt. I'm using kosher salt. Well, none of those have iodine in them. So people yeah. think because they're using salt, they're getting iodine because salt has iodine, right? Uh, but no, it doesn't. Unless the iodine is added in specifically, there's no iodine in salt, just to be sure. Yeah. So, yeah, like Morton's iodized salt, right? That's what they call it. Is, it, is there a different type of iodine or anything like that or just different um, ways that, it is, that you can take it or whatever? Because, yeah, you can yeah. get it. So it, it, in Morton's salt, it comes as iodide, which is a uh, sodium iodide is a uh, salt. Um, the same as sodium chloride is a salt. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the iodide does supply iodine. Um, there are other glands that prefer the iodine to the iodide. Now iodine is the, I, the, the um, iodine molecules uh, or the iodine atoms together to form a molecule. And it's just iodine. Whereas a salt is uh, like potassium iodide uh, is a salt, and that dissolves in water really easily. So the red stuff that you get, the iodine, which the, they use for cuts and uh, antiseptic and all that, um, that is usually a um, a uh, alcohol solution of iodine because it's soluble in alcohol, and not as opposed to iodine. Now um, there is. As some evidence that, that some glands prefer iodine and some prefer iodide, the thyroid gland does well with either. The thyroid gland is so efficient at taking up iodine and iodine um, that if you take, if you're deficient at all and you take some, it'll just suck it up. And that's how they do the, um, they get rid of people's thyroid glands when they're, they have a big goiter or something because they're deficient in iodine. So they give them radioactive iodide and, and the gland, nowhere else in your body, it doesn't like do any damage anywhere in the body, but it, all this radioactive iodine gets sucked up into the gland and, uh, and then it kills the gland, the, the um, thyroid gland, mm. um, because, uh, because that's where it's preferentially taken up. Whereas everywhere else in the body is not affected by the radioactive iodine. Huh. Interesting. Well, we're going to talk about iodine a little bit later because we have a special announcement to make, but we're going to get to that a little bit later today. So um, let's talk more about, so like I hear a lot about like Hashimoto's and then, so there's hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. And I believe one is called Graves disease and the other is, is Hashimoto's, right? Can you maybe talk about the differences and who gets what and which one's more common and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So Graves disease is also an autoimmune disease uh, against a protein in the, in the thyroid gland. Um, and uh, Graves disease causes the release of a bunch of thyroid. It causes the inflammation 
in the thyroid gland and you make a whole bunch of extra thyroid. I had somebody come in with Graves' disease and was, was one of my patients before, and he was this, you know, fat, jolly um, chef, and he was a really good chef at a local um, hotel, um, and, uh, and he came in, I did not recognize him. He was skinny, he was sweating, uh, and, and his clothes didn't fit right, and I'm like, dude, how'd you lose so much weight? He said, I don't know. Um, I can't sleep at night, I'm going crazy, and I can't uh, be steady, I'm shaking all the time. Uh, so we tested him and he had Graves' disease. Uh, so the excess thyroid hormone makes your metabolism go so fast that, um, that, that you burn fat uh, really well. Because instead of having a 3,000 calorie a day metabolism, now you have a 5,000 calorie a day metabolism. And it's hard to keep up with that by eating, so, uh, so you burn it pretty thing. well. <laughs> but okay, yeah, you know what? There was a, a, a group in um, Los Angeles uh, that had a, a weight loss clinic, and their weight loss clinic was they would give huge doses of thyroid to people. So people are walking around going, wow, I'm losing weight. This is awesome. Yeah, right. The, the problem is it didn't work in everybody, which was really interesting. And then the, the other thing was it caused palpitations of the heart and, uh, and arrhythmias of the heart. Um, and then when they went off it, they gained all the way back again. So it wasn't a long-term solution. So um, as much as people have tried to do that, I just need to lose weight by increasing my metabolism. Uh, yeah. Thyroid is not a good way to do that. Yeah, but having so, a healthy th thyroid is really important. Yeah, yeah. Hormones. So when so the, this guy, when he came in and he's sweating and, and he's shaking and his heart's beating really fast, and he's like, he says, I feel like I'm being pushed all the time. I'm like, go, 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 go. Um, there's a name for that. It's called thyroid storm. Uh, thyroid storm is when, when the thyroid releases a whole bunch of thyroid hormone at the same time. And you get all those symptoms, the, the sweating, palpitations, the nervousness, jitteriness, um, uh, all at the same time. Uh, it's uh, it, it's a, uh, an excess, like a lot of excess all of a sudden. Um, so some people with Graves' disease don't get thyroid storm. They just get high thyroid and they might get palpitations and they sweat a lot more. Uh, they may not lose weight, uh, some do, but it depends on the level of thyroid that they have. So. Graves' disease is, is one common cause of hyper or too much thyroid, hyperthyroidism. Hypothyroidism is low thyroid, and that's more often an adrenal problem. I have found it more often to be a, an adrenal problem than a, a pure thyroid problem. Um, I have had some people with um, antibodies, antithyroglobulin antibodies, where they don't have a lot of thyroid available and some people are just low thyroid. They just produce less thyroid than they need. And so there's a lot of people that, are, that supplement, take extra thyroid to, uh, to make up. So if you need this much and you're only making this much, then you supplement that to get you up to the level that you need. Um, <laughs> what's really cool about supplementation is there's a lot of play in there. The, uh, the thyroid gland uh, can, can adjust to the need for thyroid. So if you're not getting enough and your thyroid stimulating hormone from your pituitary gland is saying, hey, you need more, uh, and you take more and you get up to the level, then the thyroid stimulating gland goes, okay, that's enough. That's good. So you can follow sort of the TSH as a good way to follow that. Um, however, if you take too much, uh, then, then the, uh, the thyroid gland will just make a little less and get you down to your normal level. And you take a little extra, and the thyroid gland will make a little less, get you down your level. Then you take a little more, your thyroid gland, and then when your thyroid gland gets to zero and you take more, then you get hypo, hyperthyroid. So you can take too much, but there's some play in there where your gland will adjust um, to your, to your um, supplement. Uh, and that's, that, that makes it easy to, to supplement. You don't have to worry about being exactly right on. Interesting. <clears throat> um, so when, uh, when doctors prescribe more thyroid, is that like a natural, is that kind of like insulin or something or where does that thyroid come from? Ah, very good. Um, uh, thyroid uh, is, uh, there's what's called synthroid or synthetic thyroid. 
And the, the synthetic, it's, it's thyroid hormone. It's exactly the same as the T4 your own thyroid gland makes. Um, but it's just the T4. It's isolated, just the T4. Whereas if you're taking like a natural thyroid extract, um, there's several different kinds, Nature Thyroid and West Thyroid and uh, Armor Thyroid. These are all thyroid extracts from a gland. So they have T1, T2, T3, T4. Whereas, whereas the, what the doctor prescribes, the prescription is uh, almost always a just T4. Why is that important? Well, the T4 is an inactive hormone. It's not the active hormone. And it's the reservoir. So you have this like reservoir of hormone and, and it can be a little higher, a little lower, and that's okay for the reservoir. But a, the T3 is the active hormone. So what your body does when you need more thyroid, it takes the T4 and it converts it to T3 to be used actively. It's kind of like you have this reservoir uh, that you know the lake fills up and then you have the, um, the, the pipe goes down into the city and goes out to all the different places and everybody's got a spigot to turn it on. That spigot is like a, like a TPO enzyme um, that turns on, makes some T3 to be used locally and then turns off, turns on and off. And over here it could be turned on and off, over here it could be turned on and off. And so you can use it as needed um, from the T4 being made into the T3. So, so here's the problem with, that sometimes comes up. Not always. Most people do the T4 very well because it just fills up their reservoir and then they can use it. Some people don't make that conversion from the T4 to the T3 very well. Um, uh, sometimes because of a lack of like selenium, for example, or their enzymes aren't functioning very well. <laughs> so they... Um, they take more T4, more T4, more T4, but they're not getting more T3. They're T3, they're just getting more discrepancy between the T4 and the T3. Um, so those kind of people, I usually change to a natural thyroid so that they're getting the T3 also. So when you increase it, you're increasing the T4 and the T3. Um, and that gives them a, uh, a better functioning if, if they're not making the conversion from T4 to T3 very well. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Hey, Leslie, do you have anything coming in on Facebook that we should, uh, uh, any questions or feedback? Yeah, we do have a question here from April. She is wondering if this can be hereditary and is it hard for doctors to diagnose? Um, of course, um, any enzyme function can be hereditary. So uh, yes, it can be hereditary. And uh, the functioning of the enzyme depends on um, how well it's working. So uh, that's variable. And uh, so yes, it can be hereditary. Um, and then is it hard to diagnose? Well, it's actually really simple as far as uh, it, it, it's an easy thing to do because we have all the tests for it. Um, the problem is in medical school and even endocrinologists don't learn about normal thyroid function we're taught about abnormal certain things like graves disease you know that that's well studied and hashimoto's thyroiditis and that's well studied but really only if it's uh, uh infl inflamed if the thyroid gland is inflamed um so there are specific illnesses that are studied but normal thyroid function is not understood so if you ask an endocrinologist what is a no normal thyroid function supposed to be like uh, the test, they would say, well, the TSH has to be in this range. And then they don't know the, the T4 to T3 ratio uh, or the levels of antibodies, what they mean in different ones. And, uh, and uh, so how it should look on a normal basis. So when the tests are done, uh, the screening test is generally just to do a TSH. That's the thyroid stimulating hormone. It's not even a thyroid hormone. It's really a pituitary hormone. Um, it's the pituitary hormone that tells the thyroid gland what to do. Um, so um, without measuring all of them, you may not know what's going on. So in that case, yeah, it's really hard to diagnose. But if you do all the tests and you know how to interpret them, it's really easy. Well, cool. Anything else on Facebook, Leslie? Uh, we did have a question just wanting to discuss um, Hashimoto's a little more. Uh, which we did cover quite a bit. Yeah. Let's see. 
<clears throat> yeah, somebody asked about the thyroid storm. So uh, I don't know if you saw that, uh, Dr. Saunders, and answered it on the fly. Well, that was perfect timing. Mm -hmm. uh, nicely done there. Uh, yeah. Hey, how did how did you know? That's exactly what I did. I saw it, I saw it flash up. And I go, oh yeah, thyroid storm. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. Um, so all right, we got a question from Krish. We couldn't have a webinar without at least one one question from Krish. So let's get at it here. They're such good questions. I love. Yeah, questions. way beyond my, um, like this guy is way smarter than I am. So, all right, uh, physicians measure TSH levels and if high, they prescribe levothyroxine. Yes. Exactly, if, if, that's exactly what I was gonna say. Levothyroxine, <laughs> I can't say that word. Levo Wait, what is it? Levothyroxine. Levothyroxine, 50 microgram strength. Is measuring TSH the best way to diagnose hypothyroidism? Um, well, no. And, and you know, it's always been known that the TSH is sort of a general screening, but not really a good way to diagnose it because um, what they used to call it when I was in medical school, they called it um, hyperthyroid hypothyroidism or euthyroid hypothyroidism. And the reason was is because they defined uh, whether you were hyper or hypo by the, uh, by the TSH, uh, but they found out that you could have low, normal TSH and low thyroid. And then you can have normal TSH and high thyroid or high TSH and normal thyroid. And so it's not a great screening tool. It's kind of a general screening. Okay, you're probably in a normal range, but if you have like antibodies against um, the thyroid, you might have a perfectly normal TSH and still not have a functional thyroid hormone available because of the antibodies. Um, or you can have a, uh, a normal T4, uh, which crosses the blood brain barrier, but the T3 does not cross the blood brain barrier. So you might have low active thyroid, but the inactive T4 looks great. So your, your brain is saying, no, you're good. But but you, but you're not working. You don't, you don't have enough T3, which is the functional thyroid, uh, to to work in your body. So uh, yes, the, the the TSH is generally used for screening, and it's not a wonderful screening tool. It really is kind of just basic. Hmm. Uh, I want to skip down to Grace's question. So she, let's see, she said earlier she was diagnosed with Hashimoto's almost 30 years ago and has been trying to get her body back to health since then. Um, she said for the first 10 years, she was on Synthroid alone. Not sufficient for me. Once I was put on T3 and then natural thyroid armor, better but hard to manage amounts. Any tips for her there? Ah, uh, yeah, that's hard. So um, here's the thing. Our bodies are so good at regulation and, and that's what we're doing. We're constantly regulating um, you know, like I said, during the winter time, it goes up a little bit, or in the summertime, it goes down a little bit, and then there's the individual regulation all over the body. So you're taking this T3, and it, and, it, and it goes to every cell in your body, but they all don't need it in the same amounts. So the, the local control is lost, and, uh, and now you're trying to regulate, oh, a little too much, oh, a little too little, a little too much, a little too little. Uh, it's really hard to do. So in those cases, what I found is, to regulate the adrenal glands helps to get the thyroid gland more functional. And the adrenal gland function is the 610 reset program. Uh, that's the easiest way to start off with, with getting your adrenal glands to function well and then getting your thyroid to work well. So the 610 reset, you don't eat after six and you go to bed by 10. And so you have a good circadian rhythm and that gets the adrenal glands functional. When you have a good circadian rhythm, then the thyroid gland will go, oh, I know where I'm supposed to be. It's, a, it's helpful. Yeah. How, how long does it take, if you're doing the 610 reset regularly, how many days or weeks or whatever does it take for that to kind of get healthy normal again? Um, I'm really surprised at how fast it works. It's uh, within a week. Um, I, 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 it's kind of gradual, so it's not like all of a sudden, like, you're, like it's terrible and then boom, okay, I'm all better. Uh, yeah. It's kind of like, yeah, I'm gradually getting better. But, uh, you know, I've even had, you know, 30-year-olds who are otherwise healthy say, wow, it's a 
game changer. It's like, I'm, I'm so much better than I was only a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, in doing this. And yeah, it's quickly, it happens quickly. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good news. Yeah. So you can get good results really quickly with that. Stay at it. So if, it, if you don't notice a difference in a couple of days, uh, you know, keep at it. So good stuff. And that's, I mean, that's really, it's simple. It's not easy. As we've talked about now, how it's not really easy to stop eating after six because a lot of people, myself included, and uh, it's, it, you know, you get a craving for whatever, chips, popcorn, snacks. Yeah. That's the hardest time to say no to that stuff because it's yeah. late in the day and yeah. <clears throat> so the other, the other half to that uh, question is, okay, what else can I do um, to, to stabilize the function of the thyroid? And we already talked about a couple of things, um, iodine and uh, selenium. Uh, iodine and selenium are really important for having a stable functioning thyroid. Uh, the other one is tyrosine. And uh, some people have a problem with tyrosine metabolism. And um, without enough tyrosine, you can't make the thyroid hormone uh, in your body. So no, the gland, the gland doesn't work without the tyrosine. So you have to have uh, the, the right components available and, uh, and allow the gland and the body to adjust appropriately. Okay. Uh, let's see, Chris had part two to question here. Second question is, should the subject take thyroid hormone as above forever? This is the levothyroxine 50. Okay. Um, um, the answer to that is um, yes and no. It's a qualified yes. Um, generally, there's a reason why you need the thyroid hormone. Um, but I've had people come in that are on, have been on levothyroxine for years and uh, and we we give them iodine selenium tyrosine um, appropriate doses of things to get their adrenal glands functioning well and they go off the thyroid and they don't notice a difference they're just fine without it so so it, it's not a it's not a forever thing glands are amazing that all of the glands in our bodies will shut down as soon as we start taking the hormone that that gland makes so um, men that are taking testosterone shut off their testicles. Uh, people that take cortisone shut off their adrenal glands. People that take uh, iodine shut off their, their um, thyroid gland. Or not iodine. People that take thyroid hormone shut off their thyroid gland. Um, so, uh, so, but what's really cool is like studies done in women who are taking birth control pills. So they're taking these um, estrogenic and progestogenic uh, hormones uh, to shut off their ovaries and they can be doing that for 10 years and as soon as they stop boom the ovaries just come back and start functioning again and start making their hormone and they all do that but there are a few of them that you have to be careful with like adrenals if you if you're taking cortisone for a long period of time you shut off your adrenals uh, then it may take a couple of weeks for that adrenal gland to start functioning again and, uh, and in the meantime, you won't have any, and that's why you wean off really slowly with some of the hormones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Leslie, can you tackle a couple of the Q and A's, uh, questions that came in in the Q and A section? Yes, we do have uh, quite a few questions uh, talking about selenium and how much to take per day or per week. And then also, uh, Gary mentioned that in the Diabetes Solution Kit, we talk about taking vitamins once per week. Um, so is that what you would still recommend, is taking all your vitamins once per week? Or when you're taking fish oil, et cetera, should we spread those out? Uh, OK. Um, uh, there's a, there are several principles involved with, uh, with taking vitamins, uh, including iodine. Yes, iodine once per week. Uh, selenium, yeah, if you get one milligram once a week. Um, when you do it once a week, uh, you can never get deficient, and, but also you're not going to inhibit the other ones. So in some cases, if you, if you pack all your vitamins together and take a huge multivitamin or this pack of, of uh, you know, they come in those plastic packs, you know, open them up and take a handful of pills all in one day. Um, well, you, what you don't know is you may be inhibiting some of your, um, so especially minerals, because if you're taking zinc, which is in milligram quantities, you're going to inhibit copper, which is in microgram quantities. 
Um, if you're taking divalent cations like calcium, then you're going to inhibit zinc and, and, uh, and magnesium. So, um, so it's not always best to take them all together. And uh, one of the things that I thought was a great idea, because uh, I came up with it, <laughs> uh, someone came in to me with uh, two uh, um, uh, shopping bags filled to the brim with bottles of supplements. And she says, I am so sick of like dealing with my supplements every day, all day long. I'm, I'm taking caps off and taking pills and um, and uh, she said, she said, what do I really need out of this? And so we pared them all down and she had like four, four things to take uh, every day. Um, and the things to take every day are things like B vitamins. They're water soluble vitamins. They don't inhibit one another. They're not, uh, in fact, they don't even work together necessarily. Some of them do like B6, B9, B12, but uh, mostly don't. Um, so, uh, and so if she, if she had these four supplements to take. And she goes, well, what am I going to do with all the rest of these? I spent thousands of dollars on these. And so I thought, well, what a great idea. So I took the um, protein jar, the, one of those big protein bottles, uh, dumped out all the protein. Then we took all of her um, pill, other pills and just dumped them into that big protein bottle. So all of them dump, dump them in, dump it in, dump it in. Uh, and then put the cap on, shake it up. And then I said, just take two of those every day. Uh, and so she's going to randomly get all of the vitamins that she paid for, but she's going to get all of the benefits from it without any of the risks. And if she gets, you know, two in a row of uh, the same thing, not a big deal. That's, that's just fine. Um, but uh, so those are, those are my ideas about whether to take them every day or not. I, I think the selenium and iodine, yes, every day. Um, tyrosine you can take every day, especially if you have a thyroid issue. Uh, you could do that, but um, but general general supplementation once a week is still better, I think. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think we had a question similar to this last week. If someone has uh, had diabetes for fifty one years, they are now eighty. Can it still be reversed? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Time doesn't matter, but. In order to know that, you would have to look at uh, your your pancreas function. Uh, if the pancreas is not putting out insulin, uh, then you may need to inject insulin. Um, but if your pancreas is making insulin, then all you need to be is sensitive to the insulin you're already making. So the, you do that with the diabetes reversal or diabetes solution kit. The diabetes solution kit uh, puts you on a very low carbohydrate diet to begin with. Um, and eating less food is still a good idea on that too. And what that does is gradually increases your insulin sensitivity. So if you're already making insulin, then it doesn't matter how long, if you've had it for 40 or 50 years, um, you can still overcome it and um, improve your insulin sensitivity and, and reverse the diabetes. <laughs> I'm looking at some more of these questions here. This is good. Um, okay, how do you test the TSH to find out if you truly have hypothyroid? Oh, okay. Well, uh, the, the TSH, okay. So the way to look at that is at a minimum, you have to have three tests to know if you have hypothyroid. You have to have the free T3, free T3, free T4, and TSH. And that's, uh, that's a better screening tool. Uh, some doctors only use the free T4 and the TSH. But if you don't have the T3, then you don't know if you're getting that conversion problem. Remember, converting the T4, which is inactive, to the T3, which is active. So, so those are kind of a minimum screening test. If you truly have low thyroid, you'll be able to see that. Um, as a, And then if, if one of them is off and not the other ones, then you start doing the reverse T3, because sometimes with a lot of stress, you make a whole bunch of reverse T3, and that blocks your T3. Uh, even though you have enough of it, it's not working because you have a lot of the reverse, which binds to the receptor. Um, so uh, there's other reasons that can happen, but at least those three would be a better screening test. Okay. I'll do one more question here in our Q&A. When I was 30 years old, I was diagnosed with low thyroid. I took uh, thyroid for almost 30 years. Then after a treadmill test, my doctor 
told me that I should go off thyroid as I probably had excess thyroid in my body tissues. I went off and have not taken thyroid for the last 25 years. Can thyroid travel into your other body tissue? My current thyroid tests are in the normal range. Oh, um, no, 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 that's fine. Uh, just that's exactly what I was talking about. That's a beautiful example of how um, you can be on thyroid for 30 years and then go off and your gland just starts making it again. And uh, why it didn't make it before? Well, it could have been suppressed because of uh, lack of iodine, lack of selenium, lack of tyrosine, or adrenal gland dysfunction, or something when you were 30 years old was going on that suppressed your thyroid function that, that over the 30 years of taking it went away. So, um, so then when, when, when the, the treadmill looked like, oh my gosh, your heart's beating a little fast, um, you might have too much thyroid, but you should go off it. And it worked because you didn't need it anymore. And that, that's a great example. All right. All right. So you have talked about selenium and iodine, and selenium is found in our uh, Cinechroma product. Um, did we ask uh, Sir William's question yet, Leslie? Uh, uh, no. Okay. So he asked, uh, do you need to supplement with lutein if you're supplementing with selenium? I weigh 175 pounds, and I supplement with 200 micrograms of selenium every day. Is this too much? And yeah, what's that lutein connection? Lutein's more for eyes. Health, eye health. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what the lutein connection is. Yeah, for I seen it for eyes. I'm trying to think if there's anything. Um, lutein is a, a coloring and it's anti-inflammatory, uh, and it definitely helps the eyes. Um, but selenium is really important for the eyes too. Selenium is needed also to make glutathione. And glutathione is, uh, is uh, one of the most important anti-inflammatories of the whole body, including the eyes. And so they're often given together in like an eye bite formula. But, uh, but I don't think they have to be taken together. It's a really good idea to get lutein. And, and I think the best way to get lutein is to have uh, tomato sauce, you know, I don't know, eat spaghetti or something. But uh, <laughs> um, sp spaghetti squash. That's I, you know that's what I had last night. I had spaghetti squash with uh, spaghetti sauce on it. Oh, there you go. Um, that sounds uh, good. It uh, it was really good. My, my wife makes it. Garlic salt. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sprinkle some really iodine good. on there. <laughs> 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 well, so I wanted. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So anyway, that so I, I don't think you have to take lutein with the selenium. I think it's generally given together mostly for the eye. Okay. Well, hey, I mentioned uh, I had a little surprise for us. And on, in the background here, I had our, our web developer put up a special little link here. We have a brand new product that we're going to launch right here. And we didn't even talk about this, but it is in our uh, warehouse now and ready to ship out uh, either tomorrow or Thursday. So we put up a link for our new product and it is called Neurometabolic Iodine. It's really, uh, so this is a molecular iodine I2. It's distilled in water and it's really good. I've been taking this myself for um, over a month now. And it's got, so we called it neurometabolic because it has multiple benefits uh, neurologically. It actually, iodine has been shown to increase IQ, which I needed a lot of help with. Um, <laughs> But meta metabolism, so yeah, it supports cognitive, metabolic, and thyroid function. So, uh, and we've talked about iodine a lot. It's connected to the thyroid, obviously, getting that thyroid working optimally and getting your metabolism working um, normally. And so we have a new product that we believe is really going to help people um, because iodine is, uh, a lot of people are deficient in it. Um, it also kind of hits close to home for me because I know there's a strong connection in women, especially with breast cancer and women that are low in iodine are much more, I guess, susceptible to breast cancer. And so, uh, and diabetes, by the way, yeah, there's, there's, uh, yeah. links there too. So, yeah, yeah, well, this is something that, I mean, I don't know if you would say the same thing, Dr. Saunders, but everybody should be taking iodine and this is a great form to get it in. 
you just take, uh, it comes with a little pipette and mine is upstairs. I should have had it ready, but um, it's like the size of a pen basically. And you just suck it up, drop it in your water, mix it around and swig it down and it actually tastes really good. So um, I'm gonna post a link here to the chat. Uh, let's see if I do this right. Okay, this is brand new, fresh out of the oven. This link to our store where you can buy uh, a two ounce bottle of neurometabolic iodine. And this should last you two months. So this is like a two month supply. If you take um, one pipette, I forget how much comes, you know, comes out, but it, it'll last you 60 days. And you can take it every day with water. Um, I don't think you can overdose on this. I mean, it's like, it's, it's good stuff. So um, let me see, I was gonna put something else. Oh, so, okay, so if you go, oh yeah, I have a coupon code for you. So you're gonna get this, um, you're gonna get this sooner than I am. I've, I've got a, an unlabeled version of it. Uh, but if you put in the uh, coupon code, click add to cart on that page and then check out and then uh, coupon code webinar 25, you're gonna save another 25% off of the regular price. And we've already discounted it from 67 to 49. Um, let's see if I can get the right one. Webinar 25, apply coupon. There we go. Yeah, so there it is. Uh, this is this is a great new product. I'm excited about it. And we put it in purple and gold, my two favorite colors, because I may or may not be a Vikings fan. But uh, iodine is actually a gas on the, you know, if you look on the uh, periodic table, uh, but it's purple. And so it's like, all right, let's make the label purple. And yeah, when you you know, put it in your water. It, it's actually a little, it looks a little kind of goldish color. So, um, Scott, anything more you want to say about this product? Um, <clears throat> uh, iodine is more important in women than men. And, uh, and this is really important because uh, there are three things that women should take so that they don't get breast cancer. And breast cancer is, is quite common. And prevention of breast cancer uh, is a big thing and people think they're, they're going to get mammograms and detect it, but most of the time that's not really useful. Only 3% will have any benefit from that. You can get 50% decrease in breast cancer with only three supplements, iodine, selenium, and vitamin D. Uh, so, uh, and that applies to other cancers too, but the iodine is especially important for women. Um, you can you can take iodine. Um, many women who have like fibrocystic breast, uh, they used to call it disease. Now they just call it condition. Um, uh, just take iodine uh, to get rid of those fibrocysts that form um, and decrease inflammation and decrease your risk of cancer. So uh, so I, I think this kind of thing would be really important for women, and it's uh, uh, it's a good way to go. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got the link there. Um, I believe Leslie has shared it on Facebook as well. And we're gonna, once we post this video to YouTube, we'll put the link in, uh, in the description for YouTube as well. Uh, so this is brand new. You'll, you'll be the first to get this and it comes with our 365 day money back guarantee as all of our products do. Um, highly recommend you get this and we'd love to get your feedback on it as well. So you should notice a difference um, cognitively, like within the first few days, I know I did, um, and then the metabolic and thyroid function. So um, I'm giving this to all of the women in my life. And uh, yeah, like I said, it's close to home. My mother had breast cancer twice and sadly passed away from it um, five and a half years ago. Uh, so yeah, and she, you know, grew up in Minnesota, like Dr. Saunders said earlier, iodine is low, especially in the Midwest, but really everywhere if you're not, you know, taking, uh, having a lot of that iodized salt. Um, but this is a great form that it comes in. Um, it's produced up in Canada from a personal friend of mine. And uh, yeah, it's, it's 150 ppm I2 molecular iodine. So um, if you have any questions, you can contact us as always at uh, our email address is support at bartonpublishing.com. And so we're going to wrap up today's uh, webinar as it's getting close to the top of the hour here. Um, so 
I guess I will give it back to you, Dr. Saunders. Any last things you would like to say about thyroid? Um, okay, I would like to uh, give an overall um, view of it. Um, the thyroid is uh, generally functioning well. Um, most people who are saying uh, that they have thyroid problems don't have real thyroid problems. They have adrenal problems or other issues dealing with their metabolism. And it's not the thyroid causing the problem. So for example, that study that I told you about with the uh, people who had low thyroid were more likely to get diabetes. The problem still wasn't the thyroid. The problem still is the um, taking in of too much, too much carbohydrates, too much uh, fats and proteins, um, too much energy is being brought into the body. And when you have feast and famine, when you have that high and that low, it allows your body to equilibrate much better. And that's why you have to have a good circadian rhythm, um, get good sleep at night, and take care of yourself. Make sure you have the nutrients you need for your thyroid to function well. And by far the large majority I've been able to get off of medication, thyroid medication, and have a normal functioning thyroid. Awesome. All right. Well, that's really great information. Thanks again, Dr. Saunders. Thanks everybody for joining us. Hope this was helpful for you and hope to see you guys back next Tuesday at noon central. And if you uh, want to join us live, if you haven't already registered, you can go to bartonwebinar.com, register there. You can find our YouTube channel, subscribe, and you can check out our Facebook page as well, the 610 Reset, and to get more information and to join our community where we have some good discussions that go back and forth there. So, Leslie, thanks for uh, manning the controls there and helping out as always. It's always uh, great to have you. Otherwise, bad things happen when I forget to record and things like that, so. <laughs> and, Which you've been known to do on occasion. And Leslie is the queen of changing backgrounds. Like, it seems like every week she's got a different background going on, but it might get a little more steady now because you're in a new home, so. It'll probably still change. It might. We like to, we like to mix it up, try new things, so. Yeah. Well, I think it looks great, and so, um, yeah, well, good stuff. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Have a great right. rest of your Tuesday. God bless. Thanks. Bye-bye.